Hi, I'm Rob Barnes, and I'm a senior developer advocate here at HashiCorp. I primarily focus on the secure product line. Today, I'd like to talk to you about how to apply the zero trust mindset to common application architectures. But what is zero trust? Well, in zero trust, we do not automatically trust anything inside or outside our network parameters. In addition to that, we also verify everything that tries to connect to any of our systems, whether it's inside or outside of the parameters. So today, the goal of this talk is to take a common application architecture and apply this mindset to it. So here we have our demo application, which is called HashiCups. And it's built in AWS. It's a very common application architecture just across the globe. So we have a VPC, which contains two subnets, which is a public subnet and a private subnet. Well, at the moment, all the magic is happening in the private subnet. So the private subnet contains a PostgreSQL database, as well as an EKS cluster with three nodes on it. Each of these nodes has an API service running on it. So now what we're gonna do is take this architecture and start to put the building blocks of a zero trust uh, approach onto it. So in order to verify everything, the core building block for this is going to be identity. Everything we're gonna do is centered around the machine's identity or the human identity, right? And we can split this up into four different areas, right? So the first is machine authentication and authorization. So how do we prove a machine's identity? And how do we authorize what a machine is enabled to do, right? The next area is machine to machine access. So this is about controlling which machines are allowed to speak to one another. And then we have the human element. How do we control what humans are allowed to speak to what machines? So that's the third pillar. And then finally, we have the human authentication and authorization pillar. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take these pillars and add it to our common application architecture. So we'll start with machine authentication and authorization. So in general, to perform their functions, machines are going to need to authenticate with other machines, systems, or third-party services. Right? And this is where Vault comes in. So what we'll do is we'll take a look at a bit more of a practical example in our application flow. So in our demo application, we have a front-end API, which needs to talk to the public API. The public API, in turn, needs to speak to the product API. And it's the product API that needs to communicate with the Postgres database, right? But in order to do that, it's gonna need some credentials to authenticate with Postgres, right? And this is where the role of Vault comes in. Now, Vault will administer these credentials on behalf of our application, and it does that in two steps. So to achieve this, the first thing it needs to do is the application needs to authenticate with Vault. And how we go about doing that is with the concept of auth methods. Now, auth methods in Vault are a modular concept that allow us to just authenticate our applications or humans with Vault itself. In this case, we're using the Kubernetes auth method. Now, how the Kubernetes auth method is working under the hood is it's using the Kubernetes identity construct, which is a service account. So it will take the service account from Kubernetes and it will use that to authenticate the application to Vault. Once it's authenticated, Vault will then go ahead and use another concept, which we call the secrets engines. And it will use that to generate a short-lived credential for the Postgres database, right? So secrets engines, like I say, it's another modular construct. In this case, it's the database secrets engine, and it's responsible for going to a database and creating a database username and password and passing it back to the requesting API. And then once it expires, because these credentials are short-lived, it will go back to the database and clean it all up. So in some cases, secrets engines can also be used for storing static secrets, but that's not really the use case we're discussing today. So you can think of Vault as an identity broker. So if we go back to our application architecture, we can start to add these building blocks in to see how this works, right? So in addition to the AWS architecture we looked at before, we're now bringing in uh, the HCP element, right? So HCP is the HashiCorp Cloud Platform, and this is going to give us a managed Vault cluster, right? So inside our HCP uh, portion of the application architecture, we have this concept of a HVN, which is a HashiCorp virtual network. It's very similar to a, a VPC in AWS. So what we have is peering set up between our HVN and our VPC. And this will enable 
all of the uh, infrastructure in our private subnets to be able to speak to our vault cluster, which is in our HVN. Right? So the first thing we're going to need to point out here in this application architecture is because we're using Kubernetes, we're using the vault sidecar injector, which is pretty much a vault agent running in a sidecar next to our application. Right? And we'll see why that's important as we look at the workflow. So the first thing we need to do is we need to authenticate to Vault. So the Vault agent is going to take care of that for us by speaking directly to Vault. Right? Once it's authenticated, Vault will then go in and generate a short-lived credential for the Postgres database. Right? And once it's generated that, da that database credential, it will return it to Vault agent. And the Vault agent will then write this to a file which is accessible by the actual API that needs the credential. Right, so that's the general workflow of how this is going to work. Now, that's just one use case. Depending on what your use cases are, you can have many different auth methods. So we have some examples here. We have OIDC, which is a very common one. We have Okta, LDAP, you name it. We support majority of identity providers for auth methods. And the same with secrets engines, right? Uh, no matter what system you're using, as long as it has an API, if we do not have a secrets engine that we support for that, because of the way that our system is modular, you can go ahead and write your own plugins, right? But it supports a lot of them out of the box, as you can see from this slide. So we explained how we can do the machine authentication and authorization, right? Now we can move into the second pillar of zero trust, right? Which is controlling machine to machine access. So we've talked about how to get credentials into the application. Now we're talking about the communication between two different machines, right? So what we're going to want to do is leverage some kind of identity driven controls here just for the networking of that. So let's go back to our application and look at how that works. So again, we have the same flow here. We have the front end API, the public API and the product API, right? So the first thing we want to do is control what API is allowed to communicate with the database, right? So in this case, it's the product API as we pointed out before, right? We also need to control what API can communicate with the product API. Right? And we only want to allow the public API at the forward slash coffees endpoint to communicate with the product API. So just to kind of bring this all together to explain how console is going to help us do this, right? So we're using console connect for the machine to machine access. We have two nodes here, one on the left and one on the right. And each node has some kind of service or application, right? So we have the web on the left and we have the database on the right. Now, each of them has some kind of proxy uh, running as a sidecar. So we use an envoy in this example. And envoy is responsible for communicating with other proxies. So what we're doing here is we're adding in the connect element, which is going to give us a couple of things. It's going to give us mutual TLS, and that's going to authenticate the Envoy proxy, which is acting on behalf of the database. And it's also going to authenticate the uh, proxy for the web application. Right. So that's how we can authenticate the identity of each of these machines. The other thing it gives us is intentions. So intentions can be thought of like a uh, firewall rule base. Right? So we can state intentions which say that the web service can, in fact, communicate with the database, or we could actually explicitly say it cannot, just depending on our application architecture. So this is the role of Console Connect, and this is how we're going to control machine-to-machine -machine access. So now we understand the, con the concept of this, let's add this into our application architecture. So we introduced HCP earlier on for Vault. Um, the other tool that it supports is Console. So we're going to have a Console server, which is managed by HashiCorp inside our HCP HVM, right? And what we're going to do is we're, we're going to, we have console agents as well on every single uh, EKS node, right? So the first thing that happens is the service registers uh, itself to the console agent. And then the agent reports that service back to the console server, which is in HCP, right? So that takes care of the first part of the machine to machine access implementation, right? But we have a second area that we need to look at in order to effectively control this. So what we want to do is we want to stretch our mesh security, right? And what I mean by that is we still have uh, components like the database, which are not part of our service mesh. Uh, but how we can go about bringing that into our service mesh is using something called a terminating 
gateway, right? So this is going to allow infrastructure components that are outside of our mesh to be controlled within our mesh controls, right? As a side note, we have some other things that I'm going to point out, right? So if we need to allow traffic from things outside of our mesh network to communicate with services inside the mesh network, we can use the ingress gateway. And then in cases where we have more distributed application architectures, we can use uh, mesh gateways to connect different meshes together, right? So let's just walk through this in our application. So we're going back to our application architecture here. And the first thing we're going to want to do is we're going to want to register our database as an external service on the service mesh. Then the next thing we're going to want to do is link it to a terminating gateway. Right? So by doing this, now we can control what services are, are enabled to access that Postgres database, right? So this is what makes us expand the mesh security to things that are even outside of our mesh. So this takes care of the machine to machine access just using console. So like I say, we've, we've taken care of Skynet right now for any Terminator fans that are out there. So the machines are sorted. We now need to think about us. We need to think about humans, right? How do we control human access to machines, right? And to achieve this, we can use Boundary as a solution, right? So Boundary will manage session access to machines in a controlled and secure way. So let's go back to our application to look at this in more practical terms. In our application stack, we have the human element, right? And in this case, it consists of two teams. So we have a product development team and we have an operations team. So let's look at some use cases here. The product team needs to access the database to load data uh, of products in there, right? And then we also have the front end API that they need to access so that it can uh, conduct testing and, and you know, those types of things to make sure that things are working the way that they should be working, right? In addition to the product team, the operations team are going to need access to the core infrastructure as well as the database. And this is for break glass scenarios, right? If something goes wrong, we're going to need them to be able to access the database or access the EKS nodes to be able to troubleshoot any types of issues and resolve them, right? So let's go back to our application architecture and add these components in. So here we have, um, Boundary is sitting in our public subnet, right? So we have a, a couple of components that I want to talk about. The first being the boundary controller. So the boundary controller is the thing that you speak to when you're making API calls to boundary, right? You can, you can think of it as the brain, right? So you would make an API call to it, you would authenticate to it, and you would request sessions from the boundary controller, right? In terms of actually managing the traffic uh, in terms of your connectivity to the uh, targets, right? Which we'll talk about what targets are in a moment. It's the boundary worker that's going to do the heavy lifting in that sense, right? So we can scale that as much as we need to handle our loads. Now, obviously a system like this will generate some type of data which is useful for its, uh, its uh, operation. So we're using another Postgres database here, which is in a public subnet, and it's just writing its data to that from the controller. How this is going to work is, we, we, let's just take a look at the workflow for um, the operations team, for example, right? So they're going to authenticate with Boundary, right? And once they authenticate with Boundary, uh, they're going to request a SSH uh, session with an EKS node, right? And it will give them a session using SSH on port 22, right? And it's the Boundary worker that's going to manage that session for us, right? So they've done all the authentication with the, uh, the controller, so now it's over to the worker to handle all the heavy lifting for that, right? They can also do the same with uh, Postgres, for example. If they need to connect to Postgres, you can have a session which starts up a Postgres SQL session on port 5432, and it will give them direct access into that as long as they are authorized to access that machine, right? So we can look at another use case, which is going to follow the same kind of workflow here, but this is going to be for the product team, right? So they've already authenticated and they're going to need access to the database so they can load the data. So it would just start up that session for them, right? In addition to that, they also need to create a TCP uh, session to the front end API so that they can do the testing. So like I say, Boundary is going to manage all of these things for us. So let's just look at how Boundary is manages these things in terms of controlling who can do what. This is kind of an image of a domain model of how Boundary is operating. And at the highest level of abstraction, we have an organization, right? 
So organizations are containing groups. So we can see three groups here. We have the leadership group, we have the operations group, and we have the products group, right? And all of these groups contain uh, users. So groups are just a collection of users. So it's not a new concept to anyone that's worked in identity and access management or had to handle any type of role-based access control system in the past, right? So now what we're doing is we are assigning a set of permissions to each of these groups, right? And these positions, we call them roles, right? So we are saying that a specific group is allowed to access a specific host catalog, right? And a host catalog is just a collection of targets. So when we think about targets, we can think about things like our EKS nodes, right? So if an operations engineer needs to connect to an EKS node, it's essentially a target that it's connecting to. So it goes to the host catalog to do that. So that's the kind of identity and access management model of how it's working with uh, Boundary, right? If we look to the right as well, uh, we have also the product team and now their access permissions are a little bit different. They also need to access PostgreSQL, um, but like we've mentioned before, they need to access the front end API on port 80 as well. So they will have the permissions to do that too. And just as a side note, we also have a leadership group, uh, which is read-only. So they don't have any direct session access to any of these things. They just need to be aware of what's going on. So now we can start to bring all of these controls together into a, a, a much bigger architecture diagram, right? So we started off simple and bit by bit, we've started adding building blocks to this diagram, right? So we can see we've added Vault, uh, which is uh, being managed for us by HashiCorp using HCP. Um, and we have the Vault Sidecar Injector running on all of our EKS nodes, right? And that's how we're controlling the uh, machine authentication authorization. And then we, we've added the console into the mix, right? So again, we're using HCP to manage that for us so we don't have to take care of the back end of console. And so we've added that into our application architecture along with console agents on each of the EKS nodes as well, right? And then what we just talked about is boundary, right? So this is living in our public subnet. So this is how us as humans is, are going to connect to our private infrastructure, right? So that's con controlling the human to machine access. So the final piece of the glue here is single sign-on, right? So to allow us to unify our identity providers, provide a smooth authentication workflow, as an example, Vault, Boundary, and Console all support OIDC as an auth method, right? So that allows us to just bring about so, so many different workflows that work for our organizations, right? So we can take whatever auth, uh, identity provider we have, and we can use OIDC to provide that authentication workflow, right? And because OIDC is using uh, JWT under the hood, it's a similar case for applications as well. So you can provide a unified way of doing things, right? So just to summarize, as we're coming towards the end of this presentation, we've taken a simple but common application architecture. Right? We've removed the assumption of trust, right? And by removing the assumption of trust, we've implemented controls to verify everything. We can verify the identity of a machine, we can verify the identity of a human, and we can verify which machines can talk to which machines, and also which humans can talk to which machines, right? Uh, and we've done this across the board. Uh, so this gets us very, very close to what zero trust security could look like, right? And it significantly improves our security posture. I'd like to thank you very much for listening to me. I'm Rob Barnes, and I hope you found this useful. Thank you.